Welcome to another episode of Miller's Military Moments, where I bring you unfiltered stories from real military service members. And today I am that real military service member, Jason Miller, Master Sergeant Retired. As you know, I'm your host, and I'm going to bring you one of my stories unfiltered as always and this story is another good one i mean it's 2006 iraq and we're talking about my first big air assault and what we did to prepare for it what happened during it and some of the things not much really happened after it but we'll get into all those details and you may ask yourself what is an air assault like what does that even mean hey don't worry hang in there listen and i'm going to tell you what an air assault is and what we do but before that Just want to point out, hey, go check out my website, millersmilitarymoments.com. There's some really amazing things out there. You can listen to all the episodes right from the website. You can check out resources for veterans, um, videos from my time deployed. Uh, Some of them are funny. Some of them, you know, got some pretty cool moments on there. So check all those things out. And um, it's got a link to my Patreon. Hey, check out my Patreon for less than, I don't know, about a cup of coffee a month, I guess, is the great example. You can support me financially, get some rewards, early access to, to these shows. And, you know, know, knowing that you're helping me um, do the things that I need to do to continue to bring you great content. And so, yeah, go over there and and join my Patreon family. It's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, help me do this full time. So check it out. And there's a link right on my website, millersmilitarymoments.com. I mean, listen, if you like the show, if you like what I'm doing, if you love this, share this with your friends and family and go join Patreon. I mean, that's what it's about. You know, hey, go join Patreon. You know, you can even become a sergeant and all my tiers are rank based and they're pretty cool. Sergeant, staff sergeant, first sergeant, and even a general on there, you know, but hey, if you're, if you are subscribing as a general, we probably need to have a conversation because um, that's an extraordinary amount of money. Okay. But anyway, go and check it out. Um, the best place to find me again is my website. So continue to do that. Um, it's got all of the the resources and the videos and shows on there. So yeah, Miller's military moments.com. All right. So now we got that out of the way. Thanks again for tuning in, joining me and hanging out as always, man, I'm so excited to, to bring these episodes to you all, um, share my stories as well as, you know, my friends and teammates out there. Uh, so today, Man, air assault. Uh, What does that even mean? You know, some of y'all may have heard of it, um, maybe not. So essentially, an air assault is, you know, we have our Black Hawk helicopters and we have customers on board. That's what we typically call them. Uh, Infantry guys, sometimes it could be um, special forces guys, whether it be Navy SEALs, you know, you name it, right? It doesn't matter. But the we'll have them on board and we will go and uh, land. Typically we will land, um, on the ground at the designated location and let them out. And then they will go and do whatever it is they've got to do, whether they're, you know, searching for a high value target or whether they're, you know, trying to destroy the enemy in a particular town, city, village, building, whatever the case is. Sometimes we land kind of close, close to the target area. Sometimes we land a little bit further away because they actually want to, um, have some time to, you know, assess the situation before they move in. Um, so that's the basic of it. You know, some, some people may think of, you know, air assault being, being, you know, where we hover over a building or even the, the ground and there's ropes hanging from our helicopter and they slide down the ropes um, in, into, you know, and drop and, and go to where they're supposed to go. That is a, a one way to do it. Um, but typically the 160th, which is our special operations aviation regiment, those guys with the Rangers and some of the other special forces units will typically do some of those things for us on the regular size, not to diminish what we do. Um, but you know, we have our customers on board and we land and we're typically pushing out bigger units, you know, larger groups of people. So, you know, um, there's 11 on each helicopter. And and a lot of times we'll do, you know, four to six helicopters at a time and on the landing zone. So, you know, do the math. uh, That's quite a few people. And sometimes we'll do two to three turns, meaning 
all four to six aircraft will go back, pick up another load and come back and drop them off either maybe at the same landing zone or at a different one, depending on the mission. So, and the special forces guys will, will typically, they work in smaller units. So they're, they have their customers are smaller, you know, numbers, right? So um, they're doing a little bit different mission than us. Um, but, you know, so that's essentially what an aerosol is. And, you know, when we are, um, talking about our mission in Iraq in 06, um, we did this quite a bit. And in 2006 was during the surge in Baghdad, if you remember, and if you don't remember, um, I'm here to tell you that the surge was happening. So we, we had more troops there than the year before. And, um, there was a lot of action, a lot of fighting, um, going on, you know, the insurgency was, you know, raging really, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, in particular that time, uh, Sauter city was a really big hot spot. And just to kind of give you a little bit of context on who we were fighting at the time and why it was a surge and what was going on it really, you know, so the Iraqi army was defeated rather quickly, right? I mean, shoot, within the first few months. Then what happened, all these foreign fighters and some from within Iraq that, you know, had been pushed down, um, really a lot of um, different, the, the majority Shia um, were a part of this too, but even others, they decided to join Al-Qaeda or fight in the name of Al-Qaeda. And they decided to come to Iraq because it was easy access to get to, to fight against us. Right. And to try and have, um, you know, the uh, set up whatever government or, you know, dictatorship that they wanted to set up once we were gone. Right. So a lot of different people started flocking to Iraq. And I know, you know, Grant shared uh, some of these statistics when um, he was sharing his, uh, his story from his time in Fallujah in late 04, uh, you know, the, the number of foreigners they're fighting were a lot. In particular, in the Baghdad area, there's really kind of two different sections. Sauter City was, you know, 99.9% .9 Shia, which is, you know, Iranian, uh, the Muslim sect, you know, from Iran, and they supported them. And that was where their leader, Muqtada al Sadr, you know, was, and he was a pretty big firebrand leader and, you know, encouraging his people to not only fight against us, but fight against the uh, Sunnis. And so the Sunnis were typically fighting out West, um, along with a lot of their teammates in Al Qaeda. And, so they would kind of fight against each other, but then sometimes they would team up to fight against us. And it was just really, really challenging for the people on the ground to even figure out who the enemy was. Right. And of course, none of them wore uniforms, you know, or would carry weapons out in the daytime. So it's really, really tough. So at the time there was a, you know, a focus put on more troops in the area. We had like two aviation brigades within, you know, 20 miles of each other. And we were covering all of Baghdad, you know, and beyond with, with all those aircraft. And so we were really moving the battlefield, moving troops around the battlefield as quickly as possible. And I remember general Thurman, I'm pretty sure I shared this with you all um, on our, uh, my initial flight in, up into Iraq from Kuwait, when general Thurman said, you meaning aviation, you are my only ability to move people around the battlefield when the fight happens. And if you can just think a minute about the little game at the arcade called whack-a-mole where there's nothing coming up and then there's like nine holes and one pops up in the back left corner and you smash it. And then one pops up in the bottom right corner and you smash it. That is a good description of what was happening and where we were trying to figure out where the enemy was. And then we would have to move people quickly. And, you know, I'll go back to a previous episode where I talked about, you know, the best way to move them is by air anyway. So um, we would, you know, 
bring these soldiers out of their fobs and we would do an air assault somewhere else other than their local area, you know, not far. I mean, it could be, you know, 20 minute flight or whatever, um, to perform combat operations, whatever the case was. So that's essentially what was going on. And it was going on the entire year we were there. So when I, you know, in another previous episode too, I talked about our schedule and, you know, one flight company with 10 aircraft was, you know, on days, the other flight company was on mids and the other one was, you know, on nights, which is doing air assaults. And if I had to have an average on it, I would say most of our air assaults were probably four to six aircraft, you know, um, they could be more and it could be less, but, um, so, and it takes a lot of planning and, and, you know, um, preparation to, to get it right because, um, the infantry has to have a plan, know where they want to go and what they want to do. And, you know, a lot of times they may say, well, we want to land right here, but we may not be able to land there, or we may not be able to put four aircraft there, or we can't put six aircraft there. So we have to be able to work with them and tell them, okay, we can put six aircraft here or four aircraft here and two there. And then sometimes they're like, no, that's not going to work because it'll be too much time between the time we land and the time they get to the first target house. Or, you know, it could be like, no, that'll spread our people apart. Um, we don't want to do that. Or they may say, yes, okay, let's do that. We can assume the risk for this or that or whatever the case is. Once all parties agree, then it, you know, goes higher for um, approval. And I'm, you know, explaining all this and it sounds sort of complicated and, you know, we weren't real good at it early on, but these are some of the things that we train at when we were at Fort Hood. I mean, we practiced these things. We went to the field, you know, for like a week uh, with an infantry unit um, for the exact reason to, to do it, to train with them and to practice doing air assault planning and execution. Um, and so while we were young and inexperienced, we were getting better with each one and the time it took to receive mission, you know, plan it and then get approval and then execute mission would get shorter and shorter. We would get better and better, you know, at it. Um, and sometimes this will tell you, you know, what a great team we had. And when I say team, I'm, I'm really referring to the battalion. The, the companies were amazing, but the battalion as a whole, and I know I've mentioned this before, just work the way we worked together and the way we were able to accomplish all these missions was amazing. And specifically with air assaults. So when I described the, our work schedule, when we are, 10 days on one schedule and then you rotate to the next, you know, for 10 days and then you rotate for the next 10 days. Well, the infantry guys don't care, right? I mean, they don't care who's coming off mission and who's going on mission. The ground commander, all he cares about is that this is the date and time that he needs to execute his mission. You know, he needs to have people on the ground boots on the ground and they're going to go, you know, do their combat operations through this town or village at this particular time. And so sometimes what would happen is, you know, let's say we're coming off, we're like right at the end of our 10 days, it's kind of like the ninth or 10th day, and there's an air assault that needs to happen, or there's an air assault that needs to happen like on day one or day two of the next cycle. So what we would do is a lot of times our pilots would go and do like the pre-meeting and the pre-air assault briefing and help plan and then they would transition and transfer a lot of their information and knowledge, a lot of the prep work over to the oncoming team. And let me tell you, that is not easy. That is not an easy thing to do. And when you talk about trust, trust that the other company, the other pilots, the other platoon leaders, the other commander and crew chiefs, understand the same thing you do and know the same questions to ask as you do and know how to plan it the same as you do to be able to trust somebody else to do this is amazing and it's incredible and it is not to be discounted honestly i mean this was and this became i don't i 
I dare not say routine because we really, really try to focus on, you know, everybody, if you're on the mission, you have to go to the, to the planning meeting. You have to go to the aerosol brief um, because these are some of our highest risk, you know, most dangerous uh, missions that we have. So, but sometimes it, we would have to do that. And I'm just here to tell you, and I, I guess I shouldn't even, you know, be humble about it. Um, we executed flawlessly. We, we really did. Um, these teams that year was an amazing uh, and talented group of people. And, and even besides their talent, their uh, dedication to, um, to being right and detailed and exact, and not only for themselves, but for e each other and the entire team and for the whole year. It was just, I mean, what we accomplished was, it was incredible. It really was. And obviously I'm just very humbled and privileged, feel privileged to, to be a part of that team. And so sometimes, you know, the air assaults would, would have to get passed on from company to company and, and we, we still made it work. But most of the time, you know, we would have to go to the meetings and we'd go to the, the planning sessions and, and, um, you know, on the crew chief side for us, um, a lot of it is we, so here, some units, and I'll tell you, some units do not involve their crew chiefs in air assault planning, which is a mistake. We are a crew, we are a team, and we're just as important as everybody else. And our unit at that time and our leadership recognized that. And they made it, you know, uh, known that we were important and we were part of the team and we were to be, you know, at all those meetings as well. Um, for the air assaults. I mean, we didn't always go up for the, the regular, you know, ass and trash missions, but for these we did. And, you know, our input was uh, valuable and it was valued, you know, so it, it definitely made us feel valued and important. Um, you know, most of the time it's our part is briefing status of the aircraft, you know, meaning here's your deficiencies on it, but it's good for the mission. Um, here's our you know, backup aircraft, we've already done, you know, pre-flight checks, or this is our plan. If we've got a bump from one aircraft to the next, we've got a team on standby um, to help us, you know, get all of our gear and people from one aircraft to the other. So that was a lot of the, the, the type, you know, the work for the crew chiefs. And then we would, you know, really have to brief like, okay, our, every aircraft was standardized in our battalion, meaning like if we had a certain amount of oil, you know, in a container in the back, um, hydraulic fluid, any kind of emergency supplies, um, it was always the same. So if you flew on another company's aircraft or somebody crashed, but you needed to go and get the stuff out of their air aircraft, you knew exactly where it was. So, you know, we would brief that stuff. And then we would also just, you know, follow up and make sure that our aircraft were really good to go. And we were prepared and the crews were prepared. Weapons were prepared. We had, you know, ammo and, you know, the weapons were ready to go and we had plenty of flares. And, you know, if you listen to the, to the CMOS, um, you know, escapade or debacle, you know, where our CMOS would shoot off everywhere. So, you know, all those things go into it and, and, um, you know, so we definitely were valued and we appreciated that, um, you know, and while we're preparing for these missions and for these air assaults, um, this is what we trained for. And, and this is, you know, I don't want to say, I mean, exciting is, is it's adrenaline rushing. Okay. I'll tell you it's adrenaline rushing. It is. And, you know, listen, whether you think we should have been in Iraq or we shouldn't have been, doesn't matter in the, in the fact of while we're there, we are, we've got a mission to do. And we're going to accomplish our mission to the best of our ability. And if our government doesn't think we should be there, then they'll pull us out, tell us to come home. Other than that, we're bringing the hammer. I mean, we are bringing the fight. And if we that's what we've got to do, that's what we've got to do. And our contribution to that, you know, are air assaults and putting the, the infantry guys and our customers as close to the, you know, the battle or the combat operations that they need to do as possible. And, you know, so it's, it's nerve wracking. I mean, it's, uh, uh, some of it can be scary. Um, but a lot of, most of the time, especially when we are coming in at night, I mean, we, we operate almost all, all at night, you know, doing that stuff, except for that one story I told y'all, you know, a couple weeks ago, but 
they can't see us. They don't have night vision capability. And as long as we're, you know, coming from certain directions, depending on the wind and stuff like that, it's, you know, a lot of times they just don't know it until we're already down in a way. And the infantry guys are already, you know, engaging them. So we're kind of safe at that point. Um, so, but it's still, you know, adrenaline rush and we're excited to be a part of it. I mean, honestly, we're excited to be a part of it. I mean, this is what we do. None of us are warmongers. None of us are like, yes, we want to go to war. We want to, you know, kill these people. But my point is, if our government says we should be there, then we believe we should be there. And we're going to do the best we can to accomplish the mission and to try to bring every one of our people home. I mean, it, you know, it's our, our job to, to make the other side, you know, more in their losses and not ours. Right. So, you know, sure. There was definitely some uh, adrenaline and some excitement to be a real part of the kinetic mission um, because you can kind of get yourself into a, a routine or lull yourself into, you know, just being um, complacent if you are just doing the ass and trash missions over and over and over and over again. And it seems like you're not doing anything, you're not contributing. And listen, we want to contribute, right? I mean, we, we want to be a part of the team. That's a big part of who we are as Americans and as American soldiers, especially in aviation, man, we want to be, we want to contribute to the fight. I mean, listen, if, if our boys are out there, we want to be out there too. And we want to do our part and get involved and let's, you know, do what we got to do to defeat the enemy and get home. I mean, so, you know, let, let us in coach, you know, I mean, that's kind of it. Like let us in. So, um, general Thurman, Hey, he, he brought us in the game. I mean, in 06, I, t- I mean, he brought us in the game. We, we, um, were doing air assaults all over the place and all over that city. And so, you know, all of that really leading up to my first one, you know, I, I see myself on the schedule and we get to the, um, we get to the briefing and I'm, you know, uh, briefing my part on the aircraft. We feel really good about the aircraft. We feel good about the mission. It's actually a pretty big mission. And, um, I want to say there was four aircraft, eight aircraft total, four in my, uh, chalk and then four in another. And we were actually landing on two different sides of the village. And this one was such a big deal that, um, we actually had uh, fixed wing support overhead, um, which they're always available up there, but they're not always dedicated. So if that makes sense, there's always fixed wing in theater, you know, up in the sky somewhere, but they might be dedicated to a particular area and particular mission. This particular mission, they were dedicated to us. So, which was interesting. And that tells you right off the bat that this is a big deal. And you know, and it really was a big deal. So we had that. And then the other thing we had, because there were some, um, I think, believe, I believe there were some other special forces guys on the ground in the area. There was uh, an AC-130 Spectre gunship um, available. And there was, um, we actually, our battalion commander at the time flew uh, command and control in another Black Hawk, um, I don't know, several thousand feet above us to monitor everything that was happening you know, in the air, on the ground and to, you know, coordinate certain things. So it was a pretty big deal. And, you know, for each of us, we really just try to focus on like our part, right? Like this is just, you know, I've got to do my job. So I, my aircraft's got to be ready. I've got to cover my airspace. Um, if there's enemy in our way, I've got to announce it. If I'm supposed to engage, I engage, you know, I've just got to make sure I'm doing everything correct. I get the door open. I let the infantry guys know, you know, Hey, 60 seconds till, you know, we're hitting the LZ, uh, 30 seconds, you know, and 10 seconds and then kick the door open and we wheels down and we tell them to get out. So I've just really got to focus on my part of it. Right. And everybody is kind of like that. And this is such, but it is also nice to have an understanding of the larger concept and this particular mission, there was, um, <clears throat> a Russian power plant, on the other side of this river. And so there was this village in kind of a, a corner, I say corner, it's really, uh, there was a bend in the river and the village was in this bend. And then there across the river, there was a Russian power plant. W- what do you mean a Russian power plant in Iraq? So 
Iraq, I mean, you know, not everything, I mean, they didn't, they didn't have all the skills or the engineering or technology, you know, to uh, build a lot of their stuff. So they would outsource it. Right. And this is one of the things they outsourced and years and years ago, they, you know, well, before we invaded, there was the Russians came in and were providing technology and power and they built this power plant. This is one of the, the, I don't know, maybe odd things you might ever hear, but because of some, somebody decided that obviously, okay, we don't want to destroy any power plant if we don't have to period. Right. We want the people to still have power and you know, it's infrastructure. You don't want to destroy it if you don't have to. Okay. But we will, if you're hiding in it and you are launching attacks from it and you have munitions in it and you are, you know, causing, you know, death to us, the teammates, people, civilians, whatever, right? Except for this power plant. For whatever reason, it was deemed off limits. And quickly enough, the enemy discovered it. Like, I mean, they knew it was there. What I'm meaning, they discovered that we would not enter it, that we would not bomb it. We would not you know, they basically could just run in there and then stick their thumbs in their ears and go nanny, nanny, boo, boo. I mean, seriously, like we're talking, we're at war here and they literally run into this building and we did not do anything about it. So, and that's an example right there of, you know, our hands being tied behind our back An enemy clearly runs across the river, gets into this power plant and they know we can't do anything about it. And then they just wait till we leave. And then they come out, grab their weapons, munitions, whatever the case is. So, so we had a plan this time to, cause we had been over there once before, I want to say a couple months before that, um, or somebody had been. And so they devised this plan. We're going to come in and we're going to put one company of infantry on one side, one company on the other. And then the Apaches were overhead along with the Spectre gunship and um, we called them squirters. Okay. So we were like, if there's anybody squirting across the river and their little boats heading over to the, the power plant, you know, if they have a weapon, they're an enemy combatant and the um, Apaches can, you know, fire and take them out or whoever is available to, to stop them from running over there. So um, that was all in the, the pre-planning briefing. And, you know, we're, we're really trying to capture some of these people, capture or kill, get a lot of their weapons and stop them from going over to this, to this power plant. And so I remember, you know, we were getting everything ready. The landing zone looked good. Imagery was good. And here's something interesting that'll come up later in some of my stories. Um, imagery for us was probably, I, th I think six months old. And when I say imagery, it's satellite imagery of the ground. So you know, we would get satellite imagery given to us that was probably six months old, um, maybe even older. I, I don't really remember. The pilots could probably tell you a little bit better, but um, it's important because within six months or whatever, what if somebody built something else there? What if they put a telephone pole up for power or, you know, phone lines? And it happened um, and later uh, in that deployment. So we would look at the imagery. And the imagery did look okay. Um, we all agreed on our landing zones and, you know, the one sixtieth coined the term, you know, plus or minus 30 seconds, like they really pride themselves on, you know, getting to their, their location where they're supposed to be getting their customer there plus or minus 30 seconds. And I mean, when you're flying from one place to another, I mean, that's pretty difficult, you know, I mean, it, it's pretty challenging, but there's so many things that are in coordination with each other, you know, that the timing is very, very important. And especially when you've got um, Apache aircraft that are going ahead of you to the LZ, the landing zone, um, to make sure everything's clear, they don't necessarily want to tip off the enemy, but they're just kind of making sure the landing zones are clear. And, you know, if they're, they're too far ahead of you or too late, well, then bad things can happen. So, um, Timing is really important. So, you know, even in the regular forces like us, um, we adopt some of their, uh, their mottos and goals and, you know, Hey, plus or minus 30 seconds, they, they made it up and they execute it, but we also attempt to, to be, you know, that accurate. We want to be that professional and, and keep everything. And we were, 
most of the time pretty darn close, I believe. So we have our time. Um, we, we pick up our, our, uh, soldiers and we go through a little bit of training with them and, um, you know, get them in the helicopter, get them off the helicopter. And, and here's the thing, it's not, that is not like an easy thing, especially at night. I mean, this is, you're putting the infantry guys in a, you know, well, getting on is not too difficult, meaning, you know, because you, you can take your time. We're landing wherever they are in their fob and they can get on and we can get them situated, you know, and get them ready to go. But when it's time to get off, it, it's, it's kinetic. I mean, it is frantic. It's, you know, we're hitting the ground and they are getting off, you know, within five seconds, that aircraft better be clear. And because we've got to go, we have to get out of there. Um, and they need to get moving because, you know, with big old helicopters coming in there, the noise, they know we're coming, they know we're here and, you know, the enemy is starting to prepare and get ready. So, you know, the, um, we've got to surprise them and that element of surprise, the longer it takes, um, the more it can go away. So, which would cost people their lives. So, but I'm telling you those, the seatbelts in those helicopters, you know, especially at night and then it's in the dark and maybe those infantry guys is their first air assault or their first time riding in a black Hawk. So we got to do a little bit of training with them to try to, you know, get them used to coming out. And then listen, there's no way to replicate when you're coming out of a black Hawk with, you know, the blades turning a hundred percent, the engines on there's probably dust in the air and it's hot and it's dark. And I mean, they may have their monocule on their, you know, night vision goggles, but, um, it's just nasty and it's loud and you can't hear anything. And they're just running out of the helicopter and doing what they're told and hoping it's the right thing. But it's, it's definitely a scary few minutes. It's gotta be for them. I can only imagine for us, I do not like sitting on the ground. I don't, you know, like, listen, get out. And so I can shut the door and let's go. And meanwhile, cause I'm still scanning the area with my 240, um, making sure there's no enemy, you know, shooting at them and shooting at us. And, you know, I want us to get out of there. So, you know, there's all those things going on. And so we've got to do some training, you know, with the infantry guys so that they can get out, you know, at a decent, uh, speed and safety. And, um, you know, I'll tell a story in a couple of other episodes, but yes, yeah, sometimes they leave stuff on our helicopter and we have to return it to them, but that's for another story. So, you know, we, we get some training in, we get ready and, um, it's time to go. And so we, we launch and, um, we're on our way and time looks good. We look like we're right on target plus or minus 30 seconds. Right. And, you know, heading in. And, um, so we always get a cherry ice call from our Apaches, which are up front. And they're just letting us know that, Hey, either the LZ is hot or cold. And if it's hot, there's things that we have to decide. So how hot is it? Are they laying down fire? Are we still coming in? Are we not coming in? And in this particular case, that's why the battalion commander was up above us. And there would be decisions made, um, on whether we would continue in. And in this particular case, the, um, the call was ice. It's cold. Nothing's going on. It's good to go. And then as we get a little bit closer, we call it the God light, the, <laughs> the light from, uh, the specter gunship shines down on the LZs and this thing, like you can't see it unless you have night vision goggles on. So you can only, so no one else can see this thing, but let me tell you, it lights up the whole place, like it's daytime. That's why we call it the God light. Like he just turned the sun on for us and it's just incredible. We're like, Holy smokes. That's the first and only time I've ever seen it. Um, you know, typically those guys are out supporting other missions. Um, not us with the one sixtieth guys. So, um, I was like, Holy smokes. And then, so here we come, you know, we're 60 seconds out and I yell back 60 seconds you know, we get down to 30 seconds and really, so we have, um, lasers on our two forties and you can see the red lasers out on the areas that we're scanning on the ground as we're coming in closer and, you know, closer. And it's of course, I mean, adrenaline starts going, it's, you know, I don't even know my heart was beating really fast or did it stop? I have no idea. I really don't remember. I assume it was beating really fast. And, you know, as we're coming, 
and um, coming closer and we get 30 seconds and then, you know, you hear them, the infantry guys, we yell it back to them. They repeat it and we start getting closer and it looks pretty quiet. There's nothing going on. So it looks like we should make a nice, easy landing and, you know, 10 seconds. Um, and then it starts kind of, as we start getting down really close to the ground at this point, I mean, there's dust, let me tell you, the dust is just horrible and I hate it. And the last, I don't even know, sometimes 15, 20 feet is you're almost blind and maybe 10 feet. And I'm not really sure it could differ depending on how thin the dust is and, or how thick, and it starts billowing up and it starts at your tail. Cause we, the nose kind of flares up a little bit and the tail, you know, starts to come down. And, you know, we're like 10 seconds and then it's like the dust starts coming at the tail. And here's another thing. We have to make that call to the pilots so they can anticipate the dust covering up their chin bubbles that they're looking below and their windows out their door. So, you know, all these things, they're watching the landing zone as they're controlling the aircraft. We are also looking for the enemy out there while looking at the ground and we're preparing to open up the door so that these guys can get out. We're doing all of these things at the same time. And you're talking about less than 15 seconds. And so as we're coming down and the dust starts, you know, piling up at the tail, the dust starts coming at the door, you know, and then the dust is like at my window, which means it's, you know, engulfing the aircraft at this point and boom, the wheels hit, you know, I grab the door, I sling it open, you know, tell them to get out and they, you know, get out and do their thing. I make sure the aircraft's clear. On my side, the other crew chief makes sure the aircraft is clear. So everybody's out, all the equipment's out, we're good to go. And, you know, we were, we talk in chalk order, like, you know, chalk one, clear, chalk two, clear, chalk three, whatever the words were, let everyone know we're good, we're good. And as soon as, you know, everybody in chalk four, um, everybody was empty, then, you know, the chalk leader says, you know, take off when ready or, or take off now. And we pretty much take off simultaneously at that point. And then crew chief's like, uh, the doors open. Um, no, actually this one. Yeah. This one, I jumped out and I think all of us did. We jumped out and we had to close the door for whatever reason. So we jump out of the aircraft, close the door and then jump back in the window. And I want to say it was Jack Holland and Jack, if you're listening, um, love to have you on and share this part of the story sometime, but he, um, the pilot thought he was in and he wasn't, he, and Jack told him like, I'm out of the aircraft and he went to go take off. And so he just dove into the window and was literally climbing back in as they were taking off, which was, you know, I didn't know any of this until we were done. And, you know, but again, communication and listening to your entire crew of understanding what's happening. So no issues get for us. We got the doors closed and then we start taking off, but I'll tell you, I don't like doing that because if I'm out of the aircraft closing the door, I'm off my gun. And again, these are pretty, you know, could be kinetic um, operations. And I'd rather be behind that gun if they need me or, you know, if I've got to protect the aircraft or anybody else, but we didn't need to at this time, which was good. So <laughs> close the door, you know, got in the aircraft. Thankfully, Jack dove in his aircraft and was good to go. And we got, you know, everybody, we, we landed um, got the second turn in, um, no issues. And, um, so, but the other interesting thing is, is so we were talking about this Russian power plant, right? And so as we, you know, land and we get the first group in and they're starting to push through the, the outskirts of that, that little village, um, sure enough, we hear over the radio, we've got squirters, we've got, you know, whatever. And then somebody confirmed that they had weapons on board. So they cleared the Apaches to fire and they lit up the little dinghy that those idiots were in. And, you know, I'm sure they were um, getting their however many versions they get when they they get to where they were going. So they, um, you know, met their their maker at that point. Um, we stopped them from going to the, the power plant and, um, you know, but there was only a few of them. And then but we were able to get the infantry guys in position fast enough and with protecting the river that time that nobody got to the river and then to the power plant, you know, and then the um it was a pretty successful operation within that village getting the high value targets that they were searching for and captured a lot of weapons and stuff which is you know typically what they do in these operations so um you know yeah that was my my uh, first air assault i mean pretty big mission got to see the god light you know had the apaches you know eliminating a few enemy threats over the village 
you know, landing in this, this field that had a little bit of dust in it, kicking the doors open and getting those guys out so that they can perform their mission, you know, and that's what, that's what we did a lot. I mean, that is what an aerosol is like. Sometimes it's a little bit bigger, sometimes it's smaller. Um, but definitely did a lot of those throughout, um, Iraq, uh, in 06 that year. And, um, I think we did a really good job of being able to take the fight to the enemy, like general Thurman, uh, needed us to, and wanted us to, and, you know, I'm not saying that they got easier from there. Um, but you know, experience, uh, calms nerves sometimes. So being that I've gone through one like that, the, I maybe wasn't as nervous. I don't want to say I wasn't as scared because, you know, fear is, um, is a common thing. And I think if you're not fearful, you're not, you are not doing the things that you need to do to protect yourself and your team because fear will, you know, drive you to, um, perform better sometimes. Right. So, cause, because I'm scared, I want to do all the things that I'm supposed to do to, to make it to where I survive. Right. So it's not that I'm scared. It means I'm just not going to do anything, you know, paralyzed. It's the fear you can use it to drive you to do more and do well and, you know, um, perform better. And that's what I felt like most of us did. And I did on even missions after that, like it wasn't that I wasn't ever scared or fearful. I was, and, but I just used it to, you know, focus more and pay attention more and do my job better. And, you know, make sure that it wasn't because of my actions that somebody got hurt or killed. That was not going to happen. Um, so, and I think we were all really like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, continue to do that for the rest of the year. And, you know, again, going back to that, that schedule that we did, like, 10 days, 10 days, 10 days for an entire year. We rotated like that. So we had plenty of opportunity to do a lot of air assaults and uh, take the fight to the enemy uh, that year in 06. And we accomplished, uh, we accomplished a whole lot and we accomplished a lot safely too. So, but yeah, so there you go. That was my first air assault uh, in Iraq. And, um, you know, there was a lot more to come after that, but uh, they were, uh, yeah, definitely interesting exciting, um, you know, nerve wracking sometimes so that, uh, the dust can just be awful trying to land in there, um, you know, and then getting everybody out of the aircraft with all their equipment. So, which didn't always happen, but yeah, so there you go. My first air assault in Iraq in 06, there you go. Unfiltered stories from Miller's military moments. Um, and that real military service member is me today. So thanks for hanging out. And listening to uh, what a, an air assault is and, you know, learning about my first one um, in, in Iraq in 06. So hopefully uh, you learned something or at least enjoyed the story. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, thanks again for everybody's support. I really appreciate all the feedback listening and, um, you know, all the text messages and DMs I get. Um, I really it's, it's awesome. And uh, thank you all uh, for coming along this journey with me. It's amazing. And the best place to find me again, go check out my website, millersmilitarymoments.com. And you can see hear all the episodes on there, links to my social medias, check out my Patreon. And yes, I'm calling you out and saying, Hey, if you love this show, go check out my Patreon out cup of coffee a month, support me, help me financially do this full time. So I can continue to bring you really exciting episodes, not just for me, but for many military service members that I'm going to continue to bring on my show, even when my story may end one day. So um, yeah, thanks again for everything. Check out my website. Um, can't wait to see you all or hear you all out there and got some really cool, exciting things coming up on the show soon. So as always, I'm your host, Jason Miller, Master Sergeant, retired. Thanks for tuning in to Miller's Military Moments. I'm so excited to bring you all these shows. And as always, be kind, be compassionate, be you. Until next time, peace.